Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good to see you all. Uh, it's been a long semester. I'm sure you've worked very hard. Um, I'm the guy who gave the lecture on uh, surviving the information glut. I hope you're surviving the information glut. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, and I've, I've, I've lectured on a lot of different topics. This has to be my favorite. <clears throat> Artificial intelligence and medicine. First, a couple disclosures. Uh, I currently consult uh, uh, with hard startups in the healthcare space, uh, and in prior years, I was a consultant to IBM to develop the medical version of Watson, uh, and actually had a couple students help me with that over the uh, summer for a project, and we had a lot of fun uh, teaching Watson, Watson medicine. Watson was a fast learner, uh, but all it can do is memorize, frankly. The goals of today's lecture are to, one, uh, consider artificial intelligence in medicine. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at that in terms of human intelligences. What do, what do hum, how do humans think and what do they think about in medicine? And can a computer match that thinking and maybe even surpass us? So we'll have a long conversation about whether or not a computer can surpass us and if it does, how. Then I'd like to end this talk by discussing what we should be worried about. It's all well and good to have machines help us, but then maybe with that introduction of machines, there are going to be some uh, concerns, and uh, we need to think about that in advance. First, let's ask, why do we even need artificial intelligence? I mean, are we, are we good enough? Haven't you spent the entire first semester here memorizing reams of facts uh, and surviving the information glut? How are we doing? And we're not doing all that well in terms of uh, best practices. For example, when we uh, examine uh, whether or not physicians find the answers to questions, little you know, clinical questions come up, a patient comes and visits you in clinic, you think to yourself, gee, I wonder what the cause of that disease is, or I wonder what the new therapies are. Most of the questions, not many of the questions, most of the questions that arise during clinical encounter go unanswered. It's not because we're not curious. We certainly want to know the answer to the questions. We simply don't have the time or the resources. When it comes to diagnosis, uh, we're wrong often. 20% uh, to 30% of medical error is uh, wrong, delayed, or misdiagnosis. So even if we get to the diagnosis, sometimes it takes us longer than it should. And uh, there's a lot of room for improvement there. And lastly, in terms of treatment, we routinely don't follow guidelines. Uh, once again, it's not because we're lazy or we, we don't feel like looking things up. It's just an onerous task to find the guidelines uh, on the web uh, or in some resource uh, in, in the, during the, the short time you have to visit with the patient. And patients have unique circumstances which call for tailored approaches which are extremely difficult to research in the time frame that we have available to us uh, during a clinical visit. We need artificial intelligence to improve patient safety. And this uh, is a shocking realization, but the Institute of Medicine has reported, and you've probably seen this figure dozens of times, at least 100,000 deaths per year from preventable error. Uh, and the BMJ recently reported that it's the third leading cause of death probably higher, that is, uh, uh, medical error in the United States. And this was a recent report for, uh, in JAMA. So we need, you know, we're, we're serious, dedicated people. We want to do the best we can for our patients. But um, there's just so much information out there that we actually can't practice to the level that we expect of ourselves. And we need artificial intelligence to help us. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, what we need to practice medicine is beyond our human capabilities, what we need to know. Patients uh, go to, you know, their doctors. They sit there and they think, gee, my, my doctor knows everything there is to know about my condition, totally up to date. And we, of course, know that that's not the case, that we're lucky if we, you know, if we're barely up to date on most of the issues. Uh, there's no way for us to accomplish this task without computer support. And so that's what we're going to go over during this lecture. Let's look at the clinical encounter and just frame the discussion. Where can artificial intelligence uh, uh, have an impact 
And first, let's look at the clinical encounter, which I'm sure you're all well aware of uh, as patients or uh, starting your clinical studies. Uh, and when you uh, work with your preceptors, this will become routine. You, you take a history and a physical, you come up with a working diagnosis, you implement some testing uh, um, procedures uh, that inform your working diagnosis, and then eventually you, you settle upon a diagnosis and then look for a therapy, some kind of approach, either a medicine, surgery, or watchful waiting, or some intervention of some kind. And this process requires uh, some diagnostic reasoning skills, it requires some clinical decision analysis skills, and uh, it in requires test interpretation skills, and this will, these, these skill set, this skill set is going to be the subject of the clinical reasoning curriculum, and uh, that's a separate thread which I'll talk about later in your career. Uh, all these uh, cognitive uh, activities are subject to uh, bias, cognitive errors and bias, and we're going to talk about that as well. And we can see that there are plenty of places that AI could intervene. We could help, uh, the machine could help us with our diagnoses. It could provide instantaneous evidence-based therapy um, uh, suggestions. And lastly, it could provide a bias-free approach. We're going to talk about all of these uh, issues uh, during this talk. So let's talk about artificial intelligence, uh, some specifics, and let's build a model on human intelligence. In other words, let's if we're developing a machine to think in a certain way, well, let's use the way we think to inform the way we're going to develop the machine. There are many human intelligences of varying degrees of complexity. Uh, for those of you who have small children or have nieces and nephews or you know, spend a time at summer camp taking care of kids, you can see that you know, the younger kids can do certain things that the older kids can do, but the older kids can do things that the younger kids can't do. Certainly one uh, intelligence is following rules. Um, and actually, kids, young kids are great at following rules. And actually, so are, so are pets. You, know, you can tell your dog to go get, go get the bone. Uh, and there's a space, there are places in medical care where following rules is really a, an important, uh, simple but important idea. So let's consider following the rule for guidelines for diabetes care. First, you need to identify patients with diabetes mellitus. You need to determine how their care is going, maybe by measuring hemoglobin A1c, which reflects control. <clears throat> and then we send a message to the provider if control is not optimal. In other words, the, here's a rule. Um, uh, who's got diabetes? Is the care sufficient? And then go do something, maybe change the medication. You can imagine this buried in the electronic health record uh, where you have a, a prompt the patient, uh, the, uh, the machine consults the database, finds out if the patient has diabetes mellitus, looks to see what the hemoglobin A1C is, and then has a rule um, if the hemoglobin A1C is elevated and the diabetes management needs to be improved, then inform the provider. How does the machine know that the patient has diabetes mellitus? Mainly by looking up to see if the ICD-9 code for diabetes is in the uh, patient's record. And if you haven't heard about ICD codes, we're now up to ICD-10, uh, you will soon hear about it. It's a way we, um, honestly, we bill for conditions and every condition needs a code. So the machine knows that the patient has diabetes and it can then check the lab data and decide whether or not uh, the patient needs further intervention. So. We identify patients, we determine if A1C is optimal, send a message if it's not optimal, and the next step, which we don't have yet, but will soon come, AI will recommend treatment approach. Give more insulin, give less insulin. This is a classic set of rule following, uh, and, and the, de the developers of the diabetes guideline uh, care will actually create a set of rules. So rules are easy for a machine to implement or follow, and uh, let's move on to something a little more sophisticated, matching. And once again, kids are, as they get older, are pretty good at matching. You know, these are two cars, they look, they have different colors, but we know that they're two cars. So where does, where does matching fit into the workflow of a physician? Uh, I think one uh, simple uh, example is 
uh, matching drugs to see if they have an interaction, drug-drug interaction. Drug-drug interaction was one of the uh, subjects that I uh, visited during my overview of biomedical informatics is very important. We have a lot of drug-drug interactions that harm patients. And so uh, that's simple matching, that your patient's on one drug and then you go someplace to a table and see if it matches uh, a drug-drug interaction with another drug. All through tables, certainly a machine should be able to do this. And I think what highlights this whole issue of drug-drug interaction is the story of Libby Zion, who was a uh, college student, probably uh, near your age, who was admitted to a New York hospital and uh, actually was admitted to New York hospital and died from, initially was thought to be cardiac arrest. She was 18 years old. Fortunately, her father was a lawyer and a writer, and he looked into it and uh, actually uh, prompted a commission to look into um, resident hours and overwork uh, and was responsible for the 80-hour work week, although 80 hours does still sound like a long time, but 80 hours it is. So the question is, how can one prevent a drug-drug interaction? Uh, in her case, she took a meperidine. She was on an MAO inhibitor, which is a, a, a drug for depression. And she was prescribed meperidine, which is Demerol. You know, a lot of people have heard that uh, term, uh, that, about that drug. It's commonly prescribed. It ends up that those two drugs have an interaction that was not appreciated by the resident. It was known. The world knew about the drug-drug interaction, but not that particular resident. Uh, and the combination caused uh, a high temperature, and her eventual death it was the serotonin syndrome. So the question is, could a system uh, implemented in the electronic health record prevent Libby Zion's death? And of course, the answer is yes, because it's now implemented. And you can imagine the system uh, it responds to the order, Demerol, and the patient. Uh, the patient's current drugs are in a table. They're looked at by the machine. The machine looks for a drug-drug interaction by consulting a drug-drug interaction table, and it sees that Demerol and MAO inhibitors are no, uh, sure, you can give insulin or morphine, maybe, but you can't give MAO inhibitor. And uh, the, this is a simple matching between two tables, and then you can imagine a prompt uh, saying you may not order Demerol. Uh, Libby Zion's death could have been prevented, yes, by having a CPOE, the uh, Computerized Physician Order Entry System. And uh, interestingly, it was not until four or five years ago that that drug-drug interaction was implemented here at NYP. So it means that 10 years ago or five years ago, you could have still ordered those two drugs causing the serotonin syndrome, uh, but that is no longer the case. And you can imagine throughout the United States, there's still places that have not implemented this and so the poor, tragic events of Libby Zion uh, couldn't be repeated. Now let's move on to a more sophisticated kind of cognition, pattern recognition, excuse me, pattern recognition. Um, and uh, that, uh, you know, children are sort of good at that. As they get older, they are. This is a, a more um, uh, higher level cognitive task. Now where in medicine do we have pattern recognition? Diagnosis. We see a whole bunch of patterns and uh, we think about what diagnosis that could be. The provider sees the signs and symptoms uh, and comes up with a diagnosis. And you can imagine artificial intelligence helping us. I've already mentioned that uh, medical error is often the result of a misdiagnosis or wrong diagnosis or delayed diagnosis. And so imagine us putting the signs and symptoms into a machine. I'm going to show you an example in a second. Uh, and uh, come up with a differential, machine comes up with a differential diagnosis that is helpful uh, to us, and we scroll through and say, yes, it could be this, well, maybe not so much that, etc. cetera. Uh, there's another way to uh, use artificial intelligence and diagnosis, and that would be passive or automated. That AI identifies conditions directly from the EHR, and I'm going to talk more about that. The physician doesn't have to do anything. The machine does all the thinking behind the scenes. So let's look at active uh, assistance in diagnosis. Uh, this is pattern recognition. Here are four signs and symptoms, uh, dysarthria, et cetera. What are the likely diagnoses? And what's out there? We have uh, one commercially available uh, diagnostic assistant called Isabel. It's fabulous. 
Um, it is not expensive. Uh, there's a student version of it that's about, I think it's under $100. Uh, you can ask your parents or your loved ones to pay for it. In fact, ask, say you need a graduation gift now in your first year uh, rather than your fourth year. Uh, and it's pretty, pretty good. Look at this. I, you, know, you put in those four signs and you get an output of myasthenia gravis and botulism. These are all the biggies. You don't want to miss any of those. There's also Watson, uh, which is out there. Uh, but it's not commercially available. It's being implemented into individual uh, uh, approaches, uh, you know, analytic approaches, a much more complicated uh, uh, approach, and it's not available to us. So you can't you can't buy Watson and and put it into your iPhone yet. I'm still working on it. So here's the output from both. Isabel got the two biggies, myasthenia gravis and botulism, and so did Watson. Very effective. Watson has a higher specificity has more obscure diseases, but, are, but really are characterized by those signs and symptoms. And Isabel has a higher sensitivity. It, it, it finds diseases that are far more common, uh, some of which do have those signs and symptoms. Uh, and I think the combination alone uh, of the two of them is just outstanding. So we have tools out there. Now, nobody uses Isabel, despite its low cost, because it involves actually entering data. I've got to, I'm talking to my patient. I have to sit down and actually enter data. So what else could, what other approach could we invoke? We could say to the machine, look, why don't you scroll through the record and see if you can find people with certain diseases? And that is certainly easy to do when the disease is diagnosed uh, or characterized by abnormal lab data. Certainly chronic kidney disease. You need one lab value, creatinine, which you'll learn about in the spring when you take your kidney course. And based on the creatinine, the machine knows if the patient has chronic kidney disease or not. Uh, certainly it's true of liver disease. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the value is stored in the electronic record. The machine finds it and says, yes, the patient has liver disease. And this, is, this approach would be true for any disease characterized by an abnormal lab value, you know, such as pancreatitis or hem um, anemia, uh, thrombocytopenia, et cetera. So, you know, we built a little machine here at Columbia, and the machine has a CKD diagnosis machine, and it looks through patients' records, and it just needs the creatinine and some demographics, and it makes a calculation, and it knows what the times are of the creatinine test that has a set of rules. Uh, using the date and GFR, uh, given the rule, uh, the patient may or may not have chronic kidney disease. And this is very important because we found in a prior study that about 20% of our patients with chronic kidney disease, the machine knew the patient had chronic kidney disease. Uh, those patients were not uh, known to have kidney disease by their provider. It was not mentioned in any of their notes. Uh, and their, and their uh, therapeutic appro the therapeutic approach by the providers did not take into account chronic kidney disease. So the machine, this is an easy one for a machine. But what about making a diagnosis uh, where there's no lab test, uh, where the diagnosis is based exclusively on signs and symptoms in the medical record? We need natural language processing of the free text to identify the signs and symptoms. Uh, the patient is complaining of shortness of breath, or they're complaining of muscle weakness, or they're complaining of um, nervousness or fatigue. Uh, these are not lab tests, and unstructured data is computationally challenging. A machine has to be built in order to, to know what is being said in the electronic health record. So we are working on that, and actually have students over the summers who've worked with me on some of these projects. You build a, a, an assistant to look for the disease we just spoke of, myasthenia gravis. Use natural language processing. Look in the record for those signs and symptoms of dysarthria, dysphagia, and, and look also for the uh, lay terms, you know, difficulty speaking, drooping eyelids. Then let the machine make a prediction based on the presence or absence of the signs and symptoms. I, the machine, <clears throat> think that the patient might have myasthenia gravis. And the machine could uh, look through the, the data in the notes uh, and make a prediction that the patient has myasthenia gravis long before the actual diagnosis is made by the provider. Now, this is sort of the cutting edge of AI. Uh, many people are working on it around the country, uh, but uh, it's an important area, and uh, I imagine it's um, built brick by brick 
here's, here's one brick, which is the diagnosis of my senior grounds. Uh, one more pattern recognition that I mentioned. This is a recent report in the New England Journal of Medicine, which basically shows that a machine can, can train on uh, retinal scans and figure out who's got diabe diabetic retinopathy earlier and better than the typical ophthalmologist, uh, or can at least refer the patient to an ophthalmologist uh, after being screened in primary care clinic. Uh, very important advance. So let's move on. We've just done pattern recognition. Let's go on to prioritization. And that's a very sophisticated cognitive of, uh, activity. A lot of people I know who are adults can't prioritize well. Uh, I think medical and dental students are geniuses at prioritizing. That's why you're all here at this great institution. Uh, and prioritization is a key uh, uh, issue or a key uh, event in medicine where we have to decide what to focus on. So where does this uh, where is this really obvious? It's in the patient's medical record. You know, in the old days, we had paper. Uh, we only had one volume available to us when we worked up a patient in the hospital, and, and 32 of their volumes were stored off-site. There was all this data there that you knew was important, a test that the patient had had that might be important. But you're, you couldn't possibly read through 32 volumes, especially since they were stored in New Jersey someplace, and you'd have to drive out there and actually read through them, and you certainly didn't have the time. Now, in a way, the opposite is true. The electronic health record has all that information, all 32 volumes, hundreds to thousands of lab data, hundreds of notes and reports, complicated medication histories, procedures and devices that need monitoring. All this is important, and it, and it needs to be considered, but who's, what mortal, mere mortal, is going to be able to read through all the DHR information when a patient shows up in clinic? So... We have, we have a lot of really smart people in this institution. My good colleague, Noemi El Haddad, who is quite brilliant, uh, created this word cloud, which is based on all the notes written about the patient. So the machine reads all the notes, and then it, makes, it constructs a word cloud, which highlights those words which are said more often than other words. And the words, obviously, are signs and symptoms and diseases. So lupus is... The biggest print here, and, and seizure disorder and lupus nephritis uh, are also pretty big and proteinary. And so you can take one glance at that word cloud, and you know this patient has lupus, lupus nephritis, which is a serious complication, and probably lupus cerebrovascular disease causing the seizures, which is also a serious problem. Yes, there are other problems. You know, they may have had a stroke, and they've got antiphospholipid syndrome, but you get lupus. These are all, of course, important. Hearing loss is a little bit, maybe they had a murmur. That's much less important, but a snapshot telling you instantly what's wrong with this patient. And one of the things I love about this is that Jessica Tannenbaum, who graduated in 2004, actually came up with the idea of the word cloud um, during her summer research project here. Uh, it was just a fabulous study. And so that's implemented the electronic health record now. And a patient could go into the emergency room, have some complaint, the ER doc can pull up that uh, summary and understand exactly what's wrong with the patient, the most important things that are wrong with the patient. This is prioritization at its best and very impossible, honestly, to be accomplished in that amount of time by a human. Let's move on to an even more uh, sophisticated task, a human cognitive task, which is prediction. Given a couple of cues or clues, can I predict how the patient is going to do? That's what the patient wants to know. How, what's going to happen to me? How, how, am I, how is my disease going to progress or not? So we uh, use the following methods. Now, normally, you know, in, in past years, the physician would sit there, look over the record, and then come up with some guess. I'm going to explain in a few minutes that that's, not, that, that's nowhere near as reliable or helpful as, as um, a, a computational approach. The method that the machine uses is to mine the data, learn what are the features that are predictive of, uh, you know, uh, of a disease getting better or worse, uh, looking through notes and structured lab data, and then coming up with a model. So here, here would be an example of predicting uh, who's going to be on dialysis when they have chronic kidney disease. Patient comes in with chronic kidney disease. Uh, I just talked about it and then says, well, am I going to be on dialysis in five years? You know, my aunt was on dialysis and her life was 
really quite difficult, um, or am I just going to be fine, live the rest of my life uh, happily ever after without ever being on dialysis? And so we use a machine approach. We've got we've got literally an Excel spreadsheet uh, of patients who did get who did progress and ended up on dialysis, and and here are all. Um, attributes and values. It might be lab data. It might be um, chest x-ray reports, you know, whatever we can get our hands on. And then we have a, another, f you know, file with patients without, who didn't progress, uh, without progression, uh, same attributes. And then, and then we let the machine decide what the model should be. And then the machine gets trained and says, you know what, I'm, I'm by the machine, I'm going to make a prediction. This patient's going to get worse. This patient's not. So the prediction's pretty good. You know, the patient comes in uh, with a, about a 40% chance of getting worse, and then the machine says, yes, now it's doubled. Uh, the machine says, no, you're not going to get worse. Uh, it's, uh, the patient has um, got half the chance of getting worse. Pretty good. Helps guide the doctor. So their, and their prediction, modelists out there in my department who who do far more advanced, far more interesting <laughs> work than this, honestly, uh, and uh, maybe you'll get a chance to meet some of them. So just one side on predictors. How do I know what's going to predict whether or not a patient gets worse? I mean, you know, could it be their zip code? I mean, if whatever their zip code is, that's going to determine whether or not they get worse. Uh, so we, the approach we use is uh, data mining, and it's completely the opposite of what you are all learning uh, and thinking about now. We all, in this medical space, we all grew up in, with a hypothetical deductive model. We base hypotheses on what we know. It's called supervised. Gee, I know something about the kidney. I know that when the kidney regulates the blood count, oh, I'm going to look at anemia, low blood count, to help predict whether or not the patient's kidney disease is going to get worse. We, we base the predictions or the model based on what we already know. The machine says, you know what? Forget that. You don't know anything. <laughs> there are all sorts of things that you don't know. I, and I know nothing either, but I'm going to look for associations. And so the machine looks for associations, and then if there's an association, then we can all reverse engineer to see if those associations look promising. This is called unsupervised. And I think a, a, you know, a really fun example is uh, associations. Uh, here we have a shot from my local supermarket, and there's some product placement. There we see limes. Now, why on earth would limes be in front of the beer uh, cabinet? Any any ideas? Uh, that's because some Corona drinkers like shoving a lime in the beer bottle, and so that the 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 uh, owners of the grocery chain did association studies, and they showed that limes and beer were associated. They didn't even necessarily know why, of course, unless they like Corona beer and and with lime. And so they put the limes next to the beer because they know that there's an association. So this is data mining at its best. Let me move on to decision analysis. Consider treating hypertension. Drug one or drug two? Should we give drug or one or drug two? Well, think about what's involved in that simple decision. I mean, what could be simpler than should you take this drug or take that drug? And for each drug, there is a probability of effectiveness. Not all drugs are effective all the time. Sure, there's some drugs like, you know, the statins. You take a statin, your cholesterol is bound to go down no matter what else you do. But that's not true, certainly not true of hypertensives, antihypertensives. So we have a probability of effectiveness for each drug. And then we also have a probability of at least one adverse drug event, at least one major adverse drug event. Some of these drugs have several major adverse drug events, although the probabilities may be low for some of them. But we need to know the probabilities of adverse drug events. So we're starting out with this simple decision. We've got four probabilities. Then we've also got eight different outcomes to value. For example, you could be the patient on drug one that's totally effective and you have no adverse events. Isn't that, that's a perfect story. But then you could be a patient on given drug two, which was not all that effective, and you got the adverse event. So, and that would have a completely different value of the outcome. So for this simple drug choice, there are four probabilities, eight adverse events, uh, excuse me, eight outcomes. And how does a physician know which of the two drugs uh, would be helpful to the patient? You know, perhaps the patient uh, is going to have a higher probability of one adverse event or not. 
uh, this is not computable by a human. I don't know, honestly, I don't know how we've made decisions in the past. I think you know, we just used our gut. I'm not even sure what that was focused on. A machine is going to be necessary to make these uh, decisions or compute the optimal decision and consider th that decision in the context of all those other drugs. Uh, these are the drugs um, that my mother-in-law uh, used to take. She's no longer with us, but she's given me HIPAA permission to discuss her situation. Uh, all those drugs uh, uh, she's already taking, and now we've got to decide between a high antihypertensive drug one and drug two, which are going to be influenced by all those drugs. They're drug-drug interactions we've, we've talked about several times. They're comorbidities, you know, drug-disease interaction. There's pharmacogenomics. Uh, that uh, influence how she metabolizes those drugs. There's demographics, you know, what her age and her gender and her race are. All those issues are going to impact on that decision tree, which makes it exponentially more complicated, which is not possible for a human to compute. So now we're getting into the realm of things that a computer can do that we can't. So artificial intelligence is going to be required for decision trees. We need to identify the outcomes, find the probabilities. There are often ranges. We need to uh, test those ranges. We need some Monte Carlo simulation. We need to prioritize decision choices. Um, and this will all feed into what our optimal choices are uh, and obviously be based on and modified by the patient's choices. So we've Run the, you know, looked at the gamut of human intelligence from uh, following rules to decision analysis, and now we're going to look at some uh, areas of cognition that are a little bit out of the mainstream but dramatically influence the way we think. Cognitive biases. We are, as humans, uh, plagued. I mentioned this in the uh, first couple of slides. We are plagued by cognitive biases. Uh, uh, Dr. Dan Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in economics, wrote a fabulous book. I think over the summer, maybe you get a chance to read this, Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, and it's basically a whole book about all the ways we uh, are, are, are derailed in our uh, logical thinking about uh, medicine or actually any other activity in life. Uh, uh, it's a fascinating book and actually quite eye-opening in terms of uh, trying to improve your decision-making. Uh, Jerry Grubman, who is a PNS graduate from the 70s, a brilliant scientist, uh, been at Harvard for many years, he wrote a whole book on, on the errors he's made in medicine because of cognitive biases. So let me just give you one example, uh, which is uh, being having inaccurate probabilities, that humans are subject to availability, which is which means that we're kind of stuck thinking about the thing that is that we most recently thought about. You know, so we go to Lupus Conference, Grand Rounds, and it's a whole Grand Rounds on Lupus. And then we go to conference, uh, excuse me, then we go to clinic, and everybody has, you know, everybody has lupus. An elderly, you know, um, woman walks in, she clocked her knee on the uh, uh, dishwasher, she came in for some help, she's most likely got osteoarthritis, and the first thing you think of is lupus because he just went to a lupus conference. And so now you order a thousand dollars worth of lupus uh, tests, and of course that's completely in inappropriate. We also uh, are subject as humans to anchoring. We get fixated on the first idea, uh, and this uh, makes our thought of the true probabilities of an illness uh, um, inaccurate we're also subject to base rate neglect, where basically we think of zebras instead of horses or vice versa. So the machine can provide an accurate probability. It can say the woman walking into clinic is not likely to have lupus and is very likely to have osteoarthritis, no matter what conference you just went to. So if programmed properly, machines will be unbiased. Let me move on to memory. We know machines barring, you know, an electrical short or, you know, a hard disk failure, have accurate memory. Well, humans don't have accurate memory all the time. They suffer from false memories. Uh, there is a whole field on that studies false memories. Um, and there was a fabulous uh, article in Science a couple of years ago uh, by some researchers at MIT who basically mapped in the brain where false memories are created. They they created a false memory in rats, I think, and they could see in the brain where the wires got crossed. 
Well, now let's think about wisdom in medicine. Oh, yes, 20 years ago or five years ago or this past year, Mrs. So-and-so had this illness and we did this and that worked out or he had that illness and we did that and that didn't work out. And so one's wisdom, and this is true of any um, of your life's experiences, your wisdom about something is based on your memory of it. Well, what if the memory of it is incorrect? You know, even now, my wife and I, you know, we sit around, we go, yes, remember we were in Italy and we were sipping wine at Pietra Santa and the kids were playing in the square. And then we look at each other and we go, did that actually happen? Um, or were you, you know, was that, is this a false memory? And then we decided, of course, it really doesn't matter. We had a great time, so let's just, just remember what we remember. So humans have an accurate memories, and that has been well studied, and you'll be happy to know that sleep deprivation, which you're all going through, actually worsens memory and creates false memories. So uh, the wisdom, just as an aside, in medicine is encoded in the literature, not the human brain. If you're looking to know what to do, go look it up, and that's do that no matter what topic you're uh, faced with or looking into. Uh, last... Uh, point is multitasking. The humans like to think that they can multitask, uh, and uh, in medicine, uh, we can be pushed to the limit to multitask. So here's, here's, a, here's a thought. This is my, um, I'm getting off the road here, and on my way to my country home, and my wife and I have a home up in upstate, and here's the, we get off the highway, we get to this T intersection, and here's, here's the road that I need to turn. I need to make a left turn. So I get up here to the stop sign, and I need to worry about cars coming from the right and cars from the left. And all I can do, is, the best I can, is to go back and forth like this. Of course, making me dizzy, shaking my head back and forth. I can't look at both sides at the same time. My wife, of course, God bless her, expects me to look at two places at the same time. Uh, she wants me to be a perfect driver, not, you know, understandably, but I can't do it. And actually, honestly, for years... I kind of poo-pooed the idea of self-driving cars, but it was at this very, very intersection that I thought, wow, that's what a self-driving car can do that I can't. It can look at both in, um, directions at the same time. A self-driving car can look in both directions, and it's got sensors on both sides and cameras, and it can probably make that left turn more consistently uh, correctly or safely than I can. So humans can't multitask. We can't attend to more than one signal at a time. There's all these studies thinking, oh yeah, I can, I can sing and I can do a crossword puzzle at the same time. No, you can only sing because you're not concentrating on it. But how about doing two crossword puzzles at the same time? No, you can't do that. And imagine being the intensive care unit and monitoring all these patients, what if, by chance, two catastrophes occur at exactly the same time? Because you're monitoring one and the other, and maybe that's why there are two people in here rather than one person. So that's not possible to monitor the, uh, uh, the machines, uh, uh, all the machines at the same time. We need a machine to do that. And that's something that humans really can't do. They can't truly multitask. So let's look at the scorecard here. Following rules, matching, pattern recognition, yeah, we can do that. We're a little slow. Pattern recognition, probably not as good as a machine, but, but we, if given enough time, we can do that. Prioritization, prediction, and decision analysis, I'm sorry. I don't think we can do it well, uh, and I don't think we can do it at all. We can't prioritize a 31-volume uh, record. We cannot make a prediction of chronic kidney disease based on 37 variables. And we certainly can't crunch the numbers on decision analysis for someone taking, uh, you know, 11 drugs, and now we need to choose between drug one and drug two. And when it comes to unbiased, uh, true memory and multitasking, not even close. There's, there's no chance that we can accomplish any of that without a machine. So uh, I think uh, getting back to the goals of the lecture, we've talked about the human intelligence, and we've talked about what a computer can do uh, to match and surpass us. And now let's spend a few minutes on what should we be worried about. As you've all experienced, technology is great until it isn't. 
there's a lot of opportunity for bad technology. I'm sure you've bought apps that don't work, and, and you know, or you'll be in the middle of a program and it will crash. Uh, the medical space is different from the consumer space. And if you buy an app and it doesn't work, big deal. All right, so fine. You couldn't find a Chinese restaurant on the, in the meatpacking district that served kosher, gluten-free at 12 o'clock at night. And the machine just, so fine, give the app back. In the medical space, you can't do that. You, can't, you cannot have a medical app that does not work 100% of the time. This is a real problem. So just a couple uh, funny examples of medical apps not working. Here's Doximity, which uh, some of you may have already been contacted. Uh, they tried to, you know, I'm, I'm listed. They send you these emails saying, do you know these people? And I have voice capture of medical residents uh, that an article I published in um, a journal, and they are looking at these people to see if the, I know them. And so Stephen Johnson is listed here because he's a co-author of Stephen Johnson. But this isn't the same Stephen Johnson. This is an osteopath in uh, Athens, I assume Georgia, and this is this Stephen Johnson at Cornell, one of my colleagues. The David Kaufman is also not this David Kaufman. Maya Rao is a kidney doctor here at Columbia, but she's also got, apparently, she's got an identical twin sister named Maya Rowe, who's a psychologist in Phoenix. Uh, Cheyenne was the only person who's right. So the, it made three errors here. Uh, and how hard could that be? I mean, you know, it's not DO versus PhD. I, mean, I could have written a program that wouldn't have made that error. Sure. Then here's one of my favorites. LinkedIn sends me an email. Subject, do you know Herbert Chase, Chen Wa Wang, or Alides Reyes? Sent me the email to Herbert Chase. And uh, Herbert, staying in touch with valuable, staying in touch with valuable contacts, etc. So, it, LinkedIn sending in me an email asking me if I know myself. Now that was kind of scary, honestly. I think there was an existential uh, crisis that uh, occurred after that. Um, I had to go into psychotherapy, um, but basically that's an error that that shouldn't exist. That 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 should have been an easy one to correct. And I think. Uh, Another area that's of great concern is that the medical apps are only going to work if the data is good. The data in medicine is often terrible. The ICD-9 codes that I talked about with the diabetes uh, rules uh, is often those IDC, ICD-9 codes are inaccurate. Uh, who's got pancreatitis? We did a study to show that the codes were wrong you know, 30 percent of the time. Uh, the way doctors write information in the note. Uh, one paragraph that my chair, George Hripsack, likes to show is um, a 30, in the same paragraph, it said a 34-year-old man and a 27-year-old woman in the same note. It was repeated over and over again. So the data is bad, uh, which also worsens the likelihood that an app is going to be valuable. Uh, I think we've all had this experience of having um, the Google uh, or the GPS send us you know, the wrong place. So we were in Europe this past summer. My wife, I, I, I had to argue for hours about why we were going to use Google Maps. And then Google sent us through a farm where there was cow, cows were all over the place. It was the most direct route to where we were going. But how we survived without four-wheel drive is beyond me. She uh, ripped the uh, Google uh, map off uh, the iPhone, threw it out the window almost. So the punchline here is that HIT, Health Information Technology, has the potential to harm as well as help. This is a real problem. There's the law of unintended consequences. Actions of people always have effects that are unanticipated or unintended. So we create an AI machine for a workflow, and then lo and behold, it ends up that maybe it's actually making things worse. That was actually true of the physician order entry system that I showed you before. Uh, trying to protect against drug-drug interactions, uh, there's an unintended consequence that uh, maybe the patient won't be given the drug they need because the machine thinks that there's a drug-drug interaction. Uh, and there's the real worry about blind obedience to the decision support. Uh, you know, oh, fine, the decision support tool is great, I'm, I'm going to follow it, and now the link is broken and nobody even knows that. Um, or the guideline is flashed to me and I see my patient and I'm about to follow the guideline. Well, is that, is that a good guideline for a 94-year-old patient? Maybe not. 
maybe I should ignore that guideline. And then the machine punishes me by sending me a nasty note saying I didn't follow the guideline. So there are real issues here. Um, and this brings us, you know, me to my final slide, which uh, of this section is that medicine is a team sport. We need AI. We need AI because they're better at certain tasks. We can perform them, but we're slow. We actually can't do them because they're beyond our abilities. And a machine can provide updated information and recommendations. Now, there are things that we can do, and this sort of answers the question, will a machine take my job? And the answer is no. The things that we can do that a machine can we are clearly superior to machines where we have theory of mind, which simply means I know what the patient's thinking. I have a theory of how the mind works. I know I can read the patient's mind, and I can help guide the patient to what the best outcome, the best decision is for them. The machine might recommend X, Y, and Z, you know, drug two instead of drug one, whereas I, in my conversations and knowledge of the patient, say, no, that's not a good choice. We'll go with the other one. Humans are probably better at connections and associations. And we're also, I think, more creative. I'm not, you know, maybe in 500 years that won't be the case. But what when there's, what, what's the circumstance when there's no data? Like a, there's a patient has a circumstance where there's actually no data. Watson can't find anything. There's no decision support for it. AI uh, has come up, you know, blank. And then the human needs to be creative or inventive. Uh, and I think that's something that we will be best at, sort of managing and thinking about the data, not necessarily obtaining it. And lastly, I think we're better than machines in, in, in assessing the value and appropriateness. So uh, that's my spiel on artificial intelligence. I just want to end by saying that we have summer research opportunities for medical and dental students. We're going to have a meet and greet on December 14th, uh, and I'll send out a reminder email. Um, I'm also working on a podcast which tells uh, a little bit about what the faculty and the projects are. We have an unbelievable number of nifty projects being worked on in the department, and I'll send out that link uh, soon. And uh, lastly, how can you resist this? Our meet and greet is on the 14th. Look at, look at this view from our, our uh, digs. We have absolutely fabulous space. Uh, the students, uh, besides the projects, of course, being this fa uh, fabulous, uh, we also have a wonderful place to do your project and wonderful mentors. Hope to see you on the 14th for those of you who are interested in HIT or not, just interested in, um, you know, machines in general uh, or medicine. Come on and sip some wine and, and talk to the faculty. I want to thank you for your uh, patience and listening to this talk, and I hope to see you around campus pretty soon. Thank you.